Welcome, Awesomers. Uh, this is another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast. And my name is Steve Simonson, and I'm excited to be here with you today. Uh, this episode is number nine. That's podcast episode number nine. And so to find the show notes and relevant details pertinent to this particular episode, just go to Awesomers.com backslash nine. Uh, easy to find and uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, as the uh, old uh, solid gold uh, people used to say, it's got a good beat and it's easy to dance to. So today we're going to talk about the top seven China mistakes that newbies have made or will make. And we're going to think about it. And by the way, not just newbies, even veterans, even you know people who've been doing it a while, will find themselves sometimes at odds with China and how you interact with them and how you um, you know, kind of secure your sustainable and systemic supply chain. I'm going to make a riddle out of that someday. So I, I just want to share with you that uh, China is a really fun place to do business, a really extraordinary opportunity, but there's also caveats and there's also road mines and, and lightning bolts that can happen along the way, and we're going to talk about some of those today. More importantly, how to prevent them. So this is a uh, an insight episode. So as you may recall on Ospers.com, even though we're just starting, this is our ninth episode, we, we put together different show formats, and this one is called an insight type of episode. And this is where somebody like myself with a deep experience in a particular subject matter will come and give you uh, their view of the world and extol the virtues of their, you know, um, kind of opinions. And ultimately, the objective is to bring expertise to you that you could not necessarily get uh, either on your own or get it for free. As an example, uh, many times I've consulted for many companies regarding the supply chain and China and logistics and things like that. And it's not uncommon for me to bill out very significant rates uh, to Fortune 500 companies, for example, upwards of $50,000 a day. And then I scale down a little bit uh, smaller for mid-sized companies that, uh, say, do between 100 and $250 million. Uh, they get a little lower rate, especially if they book a lot of days. So the point is, uh, my expertise is something that's valued in the market, but I'm bringing it to you here today for free, as I like to do, because I love entrepreneurs, and awesomers are one of those uh, elite sets of entrepreneurs that I particularly enjoy focusing on. So this insight episode is my effort to bring some of my expertise to you. I hope you enjoy it. Now, uh, now that I've uh, first uh, talked about my credibility and how much I know about China, I want to reassert uh, a new topic or a new philosophy, which is my axiom number zero, and that is I don't know nothing about nothing. And I, I share this because context is king. Uh, for me, uh, although I'm a, a China expert and I have deep experience there, I go into every topic and every meeting and every situation possible with this premise that I don't necessarily know what's going on, and I need to learn about what's going on. And I encourage you to take that approach, even if you've been doing China, uh, doing business in China, that is, for a year, two years, five years even, there's probably something you can pick up in what I'm about to share. And I know I'm a learner at heart, and I pick up things every single day from people with more experience than me and people with less experience than me. There's lots of ways to skin this cat. So i just like to point out that Axiom Zero is, I don't know nothing about nothing, and this allows me to come in with humility to any subject, and I encourage you to do the same. Now, in a future episode, by the way, I'll outline my axioms. And an axiom is something that I've said it so often, and it's, it's just become part of my DNA. And anybody who's known me or worked with me will have heard these axioms over and over and over. And instead of sounding like a crazy old man, I, I call them axioms. So I'm kind of marketing my uh, crazy old man nature to repeat myself. And uh, that becomes a, a feature, not a bug. So that's a, a marketing lesson uh, baked into this China presentation. So again, for context, because you're still getting to know me, uh, for those uh, joining us on the Osmers podcast, it's fairly new. You don't know my background, but this is my 29th year that I've owned my own business. And I've been trading in and traveling to China for well over 15 years now, probably closer to 16, 17 years. And over that course of time, my companies have sold uh, directly and, and through wholesale channels $250 million to consumers directly and another $500 million to wholesale customers, um, also you know through uh, various sales channels. And the point is, after $750 million worth of turnover, which is, by the way, quite close to a billion dollars at this stage. I, I haven't, I don't do the math very often, but at some point it'll tick over to a billion. But kind of like McDonald's when they used to say, you know, 100 million served, 500 million served, now they just say billions of billions are served. 
I, I don't keep too close track of the numbers. Let's just say we've put some points on the board. The, the fundamental takeaway you should have here is that I still don't know nothing about nothing. Despite all of that background and experience, I'm still learning. We still make mistakes even, but we try to share some of these uh, lessons that we've learned to help you prevent some of these mistakes. Now, uh, as a final point of interest, we have engaged uh, on behalf of sellers and e-commerce companies and trading companies and distribution companies and even manufacturing companies to help them with their China logistics. And this is the, the Simo Global team in particular. And you know the, the team there, which is based in China, will help with negotiating, they'll help with um, sourcing, uh, taking photos, uh, and, and other general functions that are necessary to conduct business with China. And along the way, we've been fortunate enough to, to gain some social proof, uh, and, and people have been able to find better deals, um, you know, increase cash flow, reduce cost of goods sold, and general efficiencies, despite the scary landscape that is often considered China, right? It can be very scary if you haven't done a ton of business there. And, you know, when you've, when you've done tens of thousands of containers and hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars of product, at some point you're like, eh, I, I don't know everything, but I know a couple things. And so our lessons are to be shared with those around us. Uh, so we're going to share the top seven newbie mistakes uh, right after the break. But first, we're going to take this short break. We'll be right back. We're back again, everybody. Steve Simonson here talking about uh, the top seven ways newbies make mistakes in China or have made mistakes and perhaps will make future mistakes. And uh, this is uh, you know, part of the Awesomers podcast series. Our mission, again, is to try to help you eliminate some of those skinned knees and some of, those, uh, you know, some of the wounds that I've experienced firsthand. Uh, but make no mistake, despite us sharing these lessons, some of which you'll say, ah, that doesn't apply to me, uh, although later you'll probably come back and go, ah, eh, maybe that did apply to me. Uh, but initially, some of these lessons you'll go, okay, I get it, this is, this is nice, I, I'm on board, but there's still going to be a learning curve, right? Nobody can, can uh, skip the idea of learning and then gaining knowledge. Uh, the, I forget the guy's name, but one of the key guys at Amazon's AWS – uh, which is their Amazon Web Services business. This is the big you know, uh, tech division of Amazon that's responsible for so much of the Internet's operation. And he said something like, you can't compress, or there's no compression algorithm for experience. right? So as much as we want to share these lessons, I just want to let you know there's still a learning curve. That's to be expected. Uh, and just be patient with it and understand that's part of you know, paying your dues. Um, our idea, though, is to make that the learning curve as short and as, as uh, flat as it can be versus steep and difficult and long. So that's our mission. All right, so the point number one is a lot of times when people are thinking about sourcing a product from China, their simple mission is simply to pick a product and get it to ship to America because that is a giant deliverable for somebody, especially if you've never – you know, it's kind of developed your own brand or packaging or, or you've done your own import and so forth. So just getting it from point A to point B is kind of the, a, a typical newbie approach, and that's fine. But honestly, there's more to it than that. Without understanding your true desired results from the very beginning, so as early as possible as you can, it's harder to get that desired result in the end. You're not engineering the outcome properly. So, you know, what does this mean in real life? This means that you may know the product that you want to do, and you may even know the factory that you want to deal with. But have you, for, you know, have you considered what the import export piece of the puzzle is when it comes to does the factory have an export license? On the import side, do you know all the HTC codes and harmonized tariff codes? That's what HTC means, by the way. Uh, are you uh, prepared? And is your your carrier, your freight forwarder, prepared to bring this product in? Do you know how much it's going to cost? These are the types of things that are pretty basic, and you, you'll get to them because you're forced to get to them. But there's other things, especially as your business grows. You know, maybe you are in the product development stage, but have you considered how you're going to do the marketing for this product? Uh, if you're doing it on an Amazon uh, platform, for example, what's your product launch going to look like? Have you calculated how many units you may have to 
you know, kind of do at a promotional rate to build up enough demand and awareness in the marketplace? And how is that going to impact your margin? Uh, have you planned inspections before the product ships, which is a critical step? Uh, have you considered, you know, having some samples prototyped and then sent over so you can do some testing before the major production run? Uh, what about the idea that, you know, somebody in finance needs to wire some money or needs to pay a bill at a certain point of time? So all of these types of things should kind of be sketched out. Ideally, I like to make a flow chart and just say, you know, here's what I'm looking for at the end. Here's where I'm at the beginning. And then you just put in all the steps that need to happen along the way. Flow charts are one of the best ways to kind of force yourself into having a good thought process and to drive towards uh, kind of continuity and consistency in any of your, your systemization. So for me, I love the idea of writing it down and having that flow chart and then just going step by step. And some things can go in parallel, right? There's no reason you can't do certain things at the same time, especially if you can delegate those tasks. But, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon thing to forget the financial measurement at the end, for example. So you've launched the product, you've made some sales, and it's even time to order new stock. But if you don't know how much money you made on that product and you have another product that you also are selling, how do you know whether you should double down on a winner and kill a loser? Are they both functionally performing the same from a financial standpoint? Just having turnover doesn't mean that you're making money on it. And so all of this should be kind of baked into your equation to say, I'm bringing in a product. Here's the ROI I hope to achieve, return on investment for those keeping score at home. And then, then figuring out all the steps in between, I think that's really, really important. The buying process is really about understanding the needs of all parts of your company or all parts of your team that need to be involved. Uh, I want to make sure I don't forget anything, uh, particularly about the, the factory. You know, so often we, we don't treat factories uh, in, a, in a proper way. You know, factories, I will say in fairness, I do think that largely that factories are commodities, which means somebody else who's making whatever your product is, whatever your widget is, somebody else can make that product. So factories themselves are commodities. Relationships, on the other hand, are not commodities. And so, you know, dealing with the factory and reminding them that, hey, you know, I really want this to be high quality is really an important part of the process. And, you know, one of the most important things that, that happens is factories here, you want a low price and they help you engineer that low price. And that is this next problem that we're going to talk about right here. So we just talked about this pricing uh, issue. And again, the common situation that I see happening is that a factory will say, uh, you want a low price? And you're like, yeah, I want a low price. And then they will engineer that product quality down to meet your price. Now, they don't necessarily tell you that. They just they heard you say you want it for five bucks. They told you seven. You said, no, I insist that it needs to be five. And they figured out how to make it for five dollars. But if you don't really understand that they're engineering down the quality, uh, it's possible that's part of the equation, to meet that lower price, that's, that's going to be a problem, and that's a sense of miscommunication. Therefore, it leads to point number two, that lack of understanding. Uh, so we had, a, we had an issue one time on a product, and we luckily sent over 200 prototype units and sent them out to testers. And the testers came back and said, hey, the hinge is breaking on these things. And, and we were like, whoa, the hinge, why would the hinge break? And we went back to the factory, and this product was probably around $18 or $19, uh, it was a Bluetooth type of keyboard. And they said, hey, um, well, first of all, we told the factory, these things are breaking. The hinges are breaking, and we think it's because they're plastic. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's probably the reason. Yeah, plastic hinge, not that strong. And we're like, well, listen, we have to have these things strong. They need to be, they need to be metal. They have to be rigid. And, and you know, these things are the, – the hinge was supposed to spin 360 degrees. They can't break. And they go, well, it's going to cost you. And we're like, well, we need to know how much. And it worked out that it was like 50 or 60 cents per unit. Right? It was less than a dollar a unit, yet it would have led to a 50 or 60% return ratio. So this is the point about miscommunication lack of understanding. If they hear you just beating price into their head without talking about quality enough, you're destined for trouble. And I also want to reiterate that lack of understanding comes from inherently the language barrier, right? 
no matter where you're from, if you're not a native Chinese speaker and you're using China as your factory, you're going to have an, a natural language barrier despite you know, the, the other party's uh, ability to carry on business in, in your native tongue. And, and this uh, goes in any direction, any language. If you don't have two native speakers, you have a chance of increasing miscommunication and lack of understanding. Uh, the other thing is a lot of times we communicate by email. And if you have ever texted a friend, uh, even a close friend, or emailed them, and they, they came back at you like, why did you send me that angry text? Or you know, they took the, the message the entirely wrong way. It's because these email messages, when we type them and when we read them ourselves, our own messages, we put our own uh, little accents on the words and we say them in a nice friendly way. You know, we're typing, hey, you know, how you doing? I had a question about this or that. But when the other person reads it, they're like, hey, how you doing? I got a question and it's about this and it's about that, right? They can put their own uh, tones to it. And, and that's the point is you can't read tone in email or text. So be careful that you're wording very carefully and that you're using you know appropriate support language like this is really important or I'm asking because I don't know. Always, in my opinion, you always want to leave yourself a little opening to be wrong. Uh, I often will write at the end of my messages, I could be wrong, but here's the way I see it. How do you see it? And ask for the other party's opinion. So, you know, imagine a factory who doesn't speak your native language and they're getting a quickly typed email message, perhaps in frustration from you. It, for you, it's crystal clear, but often they don't have any idea what you're talking about. And my opinion is, as the buyer, it's your responsibility to communicate clearly and confirm their understanding. All assumptions you made about communication and about their understanding are your fault. And the, uh, particularly with China, I want you to be very afraid of the word yes and the phrase yes we can. In Chinese they say kui, kui, right? So you'll be at the factory, you're talking on the phone, Skype, whatever it is, and you'll say, can you do this? And they'll look around the room and they'll talk amongst themselves, yeah, yeah, kui, kui, yeah, yes we can, yes we can. And that sounds like great news to you. But I want to just tell you that, that that phrase and the word yes in general can have a range of meaning anywhere from certainly we totally understand what you want and we can execute with excellence. That's on one range of the spectrum. All the way down to no way on earth we can do that and uh, how dare you ask it. But they answered yes to both of those, right? And so I want you to be sure that you take the responsibility to ask for follow-ups. The word yes does not mean yes necessarily uh, in Asia at large, but in particular in China. Just because you heard the word yes doesn't mean they meant yes. And this is a big fat warning for you. Please don't mistake this. Yes does not mean yes in China. So when you hear yes, but your spidey sense is tingling, start asking follow-up questions and say, well, I hear you saying yes, but how are you going to do that exactly? And I, you know, say it a different way, rephrase the, the issue. I said I wanted this particular packaging. You said yes, but I noticed that the packaging that is on the current, uh, you know, product weighs, you know, is 40 weight paper instead of 80 weight paper. I want to be sure that we're agreeing to 80 weight paper, right? So this yes is really about uh, you diving in and making sure that they understand and don't make any assumptions that they do understand. Uh, the other thing I want to share with you, particularly, you know, English speakers, but this applies to any language. Most often from around the world, we're going to speak English to the Chinese factories. Now, China is really smart. They're getting to, they're developing Spanish and German and Russian and all the other languages. But this applies to any language when you're speaking to China. In your native tongue, just because they can speak with some degree of fluency your own native tongue, don't use slang. Uh, they don't understand it. Uh, and, and by the way, I have world-class people on my team. And even, even still, they don't understand all the slang. Unless you've lived in a culture for an extended period of time, you shouldn't expect them to understand slang. When you do get them to agree to something, ask them repeat, to repeat back to you what you said in their own words. And that's another way to kind of press, press that button. Do they really understand? Remember that this lack of understanding leads to massive confusion problems and back-end issues when it comes to everything from product quality to timing to you name it. So that's a big one. Okay. 
So I want to just ask you a rhetorical question here, but do you use a purchase order? And, uh, you know, no matter how you answer it, I can say that the number three problem that we see creating issues between China and America or China and anywhere in the world is the idea that you just send an email to them and you say, hey, give me a thousand units of this. We talked about it at, for five bucks a unit or whatever the price is. Uh, an email, by the way, is not a purchase order. And the lack of a purchasing system is so critical to the understanding of your profitability of your business in general. I just can't stress it enough. So the idea for you to create a sample process or to create a purchasing system means that it starts once the purchasing process starts once you've completed a sample approval process, right? That should be its own process. So you start, you know, you've got the sample process completed and you have an approved sample and you're ready to make an order. An email, again, not an order. Uh, even though they'll accept that, for your benefit, you need to go deeper. And I'll give you just kind of the rough flow of how that looks. First, you want to create a purchase order. Uh, depending on how many people in your company, if you have a purchasing department, there should be somebody who approves that purchase order. Now, if you're the sole operator and you're the uh, person making the PO and approving the PO, fine. But just remember that that's a process that needs to be considered for the future. Now, once you send in that purchase order, they're going to send back a PI or pro forma invoice. You need a process to match the purchase order and the PI to be sure that they match. The, the factory, although they understand your purchase order uh, in terms of the requirements, their PI is the thing that they rely on the most. That's what they're, they're counting on. And in a, in a future episode, by the way, I'm going to share with you a Chinese purchase order, a proper way to format and so forth. So look for that in the future. But for today, just understand that when you get that pro forma invoice back, you're going to want to make sure that it matches every detail written on your purchase order. Leave nothing to chance and don't make any assumptions about anything. Now, the, the next question is, are you financing this thing, right? If you're not... If you don't have any terms with the factory, then you're going to wire some money. You're going to book the balance onto your, your uh, books. And then once the final shipment ships, you'll pay that balance. If you are financing and you do have terms, then you would just book the payable and you would just you know set it for whatever future date you've agreed to based on those terms, whether the 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Now, if you're listening to this and you say, well, China doesn't give terms, then let me just explain that. Yeah, China does give terms. And again, in a future episode, we'll dive into that uh, detail and, and how we achieve getting financing and how really any of you long term can get financing from China as long as your order sizes are sufficient and frequent enough to justify the paperwork. So can you get financing in China? Yes, you can. Uh, is it something that you're going to use for a 200 unit order? No, it's not because the paperwork just isn't worth it. Uh, another one of my axioms I forget the number, but is the juice worth the squeeze? And if the transaction volume is too small or individual transaction too small, the paperwork's just not worth it. So that's when cash works. And, of course, China will tell you they only take cash. But I will tell you as an expert, they do financing. Trust me. Uh, tens of millions of financing uh, without question. So once you, once you have the, the, that part of the process, then you need to figure out how to update your inventory. You need to figure out how you're going to do receiving for that purchase order. And you need to figure out a variance process when that purchase order comes in and it's not exactly what you thought it would be. There's some variation to it, right? That's the variance process part. Maybe it's how many units you ordered versus how many you received. Maybe it's the size of the units or some other uh, critical thing. The key is when you receive a PO allow for variances, and then you update your available inventory, uh, either at your home uh, you know, warehouse, maybe you have your own warehouse, maybe use a third-party warehouse for inventory receiving and staging, or maybe you're going directly into Amazon. Regardless, all of these policies and procedures should be put in place to have good continuity and good financial controls. So again, I, I know that I've already said this twice, but I'm just going to repeat it one more time. Uh, a purchase order process does not include emailing your supplier and going, yes, I'll take 2,000 units times 6 bucks a unit like your email to me said. That's not a good purchase order. And I'll tell you why uh, right now. So why is it not enough simply to send a purchase order? 
It's not enough because there's no detail in a purchase order besides the number of items you want times the price, which equals a total amount, right? That's, that's all you're essentially sending via email most often. And what I want to tell you is specifications are critical. They are absolutely critical. Every detail that you can come up with about your product should be a written specification, which you can include on the purchase order. Now, having a purchase order specification is a really critical thing to me because we include that with every purchase order uh, so that it's part of our contract. So think about the types of specifications you may be wondering. Think about these types of things. What kind of material is used? Uh, is it a, a cloth? What's, what type of cloth is it? Is it a, uh, you know, a PU, which is um, uh, uh, the fake leather kind of stuff, polyurethane uh, is the base, I believe, on that. Uh, is it made of metal? And, you know, if it's aluminum, what, what kind of alloy is it? What's the number of the alloy? You know, there are specifications that are really detailed for every material, weights, um, thicknesses, gauges, density, stitches per inch, uh, defining the type of zipper, buckles, uh, really, any kind of attachment is a very, very important thing. Otherwise, you will see what has been called for many, many years quality fade. And if you, by the way, if you think I'm being alarmist, you can look for a future episode where we're going to talk about the book Poorly Made in China because it is one of the best uh, examples about how China operates that buyers would never really understand until they've been deeply, deeply entrenched and dealing with China. In fact, that book, um, which is one of my favorite books, uh, Poorly Made in China, again, I'll, we'll put that in the show notes if we can uh, get it in there. It, it kind of, it's not my stories directly, but it kind of talks about 15 years worth of my experience and all the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and believe me, many parts have been ugly. So definitely a good thing to read. And specifications are outlined in that book that if you don't specifically call it out, you can watch them just dial it down, dial it down, because over time they want to increase their profitability on that long-term customer. And if you didn't say what you wanted exactly, then they can just kind of dial it down. And if visually you don't see, they'll try to tweak it down again. And then if you if you notice something, then they'll go, Oh, okay, sorry, uh, we'll tweak that back up a little bit. And what I'm saying is take out the randomness of quality fade and try to engineer the outcome from the beginning, as always. So another question to ask is, are there specific lab tests that you can expect your item to withstand? Can you name those specific tests, uh, like ASTM numbers, that talk about minimum or maximum tolerances? And this is a really, really important topic and something that I truly believe in, in terms of specifications. All right, so you're wondering just how much I do believe in uh, lab tests and you know other types of indicators that are objective. And really, I, I didn't point that out, but specifications are objective measurements, right? If you say, I want a 1,000 stitches per inch, that's something that can be measured, and therefore it can be managed. If you just say, I want the, the sheets to be high quality or I want the, this particular aluminum to be strong without specifying the type of alloy or the, the, the item number and any sort of lab test they should uh, resist, then you're just kind of leaving it to chance. Now, I, I talk to sellers about specifications all the time, and I want to drive this, this point home. As, as the brand owner who's building this brand, you're responsible for lack of specifications. So if you didn't write the spec and the, there's a problem with the quality, that's on you. It's your fault. I know. Sucks. To, uh, to, I, I'm being candid here with you, but this is just my opinion. If we don't write it down and say deliver this, we assumed that they were going to deliver or we said we want it to be high quality, something vague, th that's our fault. And you shouldn't hold the factory responsible or even be mad at them for not living up to your assumptions. And now it, it's a little more problematic when suppliers switch the specs because they want to save money. And that's, you know, that goes into that quality fade discussion. But I want to make sure that you guys really think about how you can measure this. So once you write the specifications, then how do you hold them to account? Obviously, inspections are part of it. But then part of the equation is to run um, tests from time to time. You don't have to do it on every spec every time, but you want to do it enough. 
And I'm going to uh, cite – so a lot of people ask me, they're like, well, how do I know what tests? And I would tell you to contact one of the labs who does the tests and tell them about your product, and they will give you some examples of tests that you can run. So I, I just looked up one. I've pulled up a, uh, a catalog, and this is some of the, the toy tests that are available that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. So if you sell toys, there's something called the, – the e, for the EU, the test is called an EN71-1. Now, for the U.S., it's called an ASTM F963. Now, I know those <laughs> all you listeners out there going, whoa, now the sexy talk begins, right? I'm talking about stupid numbers. Uh, but my point is all of these have um, requirements tied to them. So uh, as an example, there's also the China number for that same test is a GB6675. And what this pertains to is the physical and mechanical uh, attributes of that particular item. I'm going to give you another one, even though I know that this is sizzling talk. It's, it's hot podcast talk, but I want to just drive this point home. So, uh, for example, um, all of the tests that fall under the, the EN71 for Europe um, or the ASTM F963, they include things like flammability. They include things like chemical. Uh, they include things like the cleanliness of stuffing material the cleanliness of stuffing material with chemical analysis, right? One is a visual eye check, how clean does it look? And another is, you know, absolutely um, looking at the, the chemical nature of it. And there's, Pennsylvania has a regulation, for, for example, regarding the stuffing of toys. Uh, the cleaning and washing, uh, that's a, also part of the ASTM F963. Uh, then there's, for electric toys, there's an electronic safety test, the EN 62, yeah, 62115 for Europe or ASTM 963 section 4.25. Also in China, it's the GB 62115. So what's my point? Instead of you having to come up with the, the lab tests and the requirements and you know ASTM this or that, you have to talk to a laboratory and get those requirements. Figure out the requirements that make sense for you and then hold them to account and test them from time to time. You don't have to come up with this stuff on your own. And there are literally, there are tests for all kinds of things. Obviously, toys and flammability make sense. There, I, I'm looking at a, another lab test and it's like general standards for student articles like writing paper, correction fluids, erasers. Uh, there's tests for all kinds of stuff. Furniture product tests. Uh, general standards for food contact materials, which include you know all kinds of different tests, uh, standards for jewelry, craft spectacles, and the list goes on and on and on and on. It's it's so important to me that you guys understand this is not just me having my own unique crazy idea. This is how things are done. This is how big companies do it. Do you think that Walmart or you know Costco or any of these big brands, Target, pick your your brand, Tesco. Do you think they would order something from China without writing down the specifications to a really detailed uh, level? I, I, I'm sure you would agree that they will definitely be rigid about their specifications. So the, the other thing about specifications is something that I like to, to talk about in the perspective of the broken window principle. Now this principle, you can look it up online, but essentially – the, the principle is if one window is broken in a neighborhood, and this was kind of uh, talked about by Rudy Giuliani in New York uh, many years ago, that if one neighborhood was broken in, in a high rise in that neighborhood, pretty soon more windows were broke. And the next thing you know, people were moving into that house and doing drugs and all kinds of criminal activities. Uh, then the building next to it started to decline and have broken windows and then having all kinds of bad things happening in that building. And pretty soon the whole neighborhood had, had gone down, and it's all because of that single broken window. And the principle with the Chinese supplier or how it applies is that if you are on them, you're saying, here are my specifications, here's my lab test, here's my inspector, the suppliers are far less likely to change the materials or try to reduce the thickness or try to do other things uh, because they know the sheriff's in town. They're checking on them. They, they will only take the risks of trying to change those specifications or invoke quality fade where they think they can get away with it. And the, the sharper that you are and the more you're on it, you have a better chance of surviving those uh, quality fade issues. Now, does that mean they won't try it long term? No, it doesn't. That's why physical inspections and lab testing to verify are still requirements 
you know, far, far into the future, as far as you can imagine. So uh, that's a bit of a rant on specifications. We're going to take a quick sponsor break, and we're going to be right back after this. Okay, gang, here we are again, Steve Simonson, talking about the top seven ways that uh, newbies make mistakes in China. And or make mistakes in China. Yeah, I hope I said that right. And uh, we're up to number five, which is lack of oversight. Now, oversight is really all about the inspection and shipping process. Now, I just talked about the broken window principle. And I want to re- you know, kind of reinforce this concept that if, if the factory doesn't think enforcement is always right around the corner, then they are more likely to try to cut corners, right? So fundamentally, if the police are walking the beat and they're always kind of on the street, there's less likely to be crime in that area. And this is totally true with, with Chinese factories. The, the more rigid you are about your inspection process, your laboratory enforcement process, uh, the less likely they are to try something, right? Now, I do have a general policy that is called trust but verify, right? This is not unique to me, but this is a, a core principle as I do business with China. I want to trust them, and I want to have a good relationship with them. As I said earlier, although factories are commodities, relationships are not commodities. So I want to do business with a factory that I've chosen for the long term, and I want to do it in a transparent and friendly uh, yet fair and firm way. Right? And so I'm going to trust them, but I'm going to verify that trust. And I think factories, they actually will appreciate the fact that you are sophisticated and they will respect the fact that you know what you're doing when you start asking for these things and holding them accountable for these types of things. So I'm going to give you a quick, quick example. Uh, you know, 12 years ago or more now, maybe uh, when we first started, we didn't do quality inspections. Uh, we did the same thing everybody else does. Hey, we need a container of this. Will you send it to us? They're like, yeah, send us the money. We send them the money. They send us a container. No inspection. And then after we got a couple of shipments, we're like, these colors don't match at all. And so now we can't even mix the batches. Now we have to start entering inventory batch numbers so that we make sure we don't ship these things to the same customer and so on and so forth. And after we investigated, we found that the factory, the factory had actually outsourced the containers from time to time, which is what caused the problem. So they were too busy, um, and we would send in orders, and they'd go, ah, you know what, we'll, just, we'll send it to, to Fred down the road, uh, Fred being a very traditional Chinese name. And uh, so Fred delivers the product as well as he could, but it didn't match the other product because a completely different factory made it. Now, they didn't ask me if that was okay. They didn't clear it ahead of time. Uh, and nothing fundamentally changed about the execution of the purchase order. Right? We place the order. They ship the order. The, the difference, though, is when they outsourced it to somebody down the street, it created quality problems that we later identified as this outsourcing, unexpected outsourcing. So all of this was part of the fact that we didn't, weren't doing inspections, and we could have prevented that because the inspector would go, why am I going here instead of the normal place? That would have been you know, an instant recognition that something's changed. Now, over time, then, we've added testing equipment to our own inspectors, uh, and then we even use those third-party labs I talk about that, as you grow, become an important part of your verification. Now, I, I do want to take a step back, and you know, there's probably people I'm spinning them up, and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is so complicated. All of this is an evolution, Right, so you you don't necessarily start out as an expert, and you don't necessarily start out with massive volume, but over time, the way you protect yourself and the way you hedge the risk is by putting these processes into place. And this is a, a you know a big reason why you know places like the Empower e, uh, e-commerce cooperative exists because they've already identified inspection companies, they've already identified third-party laboratories for verifications. Uh, They've already identified arbitration companies when you have a a serious dispute with the factory and sourcing and and photography and and other things. So you don't have to solve all these problems yourself like we did, you know, 16, 17, 18 years ago. There are ways that you can be helped. So remember that as you go, you don't have to have all this perfect the first day. Just know that you got to build towards this. Anybody can do it. It's it is a process, though. Uh, So I, I don't want you to panic and think you have to do it all today. But I would say 
that any product you're shipping that is, let's just say, above a thousand U.S. dollars, get it inspected. Why take the risk? Just just have an inspector do it. And there are many inspectors available. Um, most inspection companies will have multiple offices around China, so they can do it very quickly and very inexpensively. It's just so easy that it's uh, the cheapest form of insurance you can ask for. Inspect it before it goes anywhere, especially if you're shipping directly to Amazon. And Amazon gets it and goes, oh, uh, I received all this, but the UPC is wrong or the FN SKU is wrong or you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, or worse yet, there's a quality problem and now you can't control it because it's already here. There's no way you're going to get your money back because you prepaid. There, all of these problems are preventable and manageable. That's my message. I hope I'm not uh, – I feel like I'm uh, harping on the negatives, but uh, this is to manage – those, those weird things that can come up. And uh, I'm quite happy doing business in China. I love China. I love the Chinese people. And I enjoy doing business there. But I'm aware of how these things go. And so I have to be prepared and protect my customers, my company, and everybody in between. All right. So we're up to number six. And this is actually part of my axiom number 21, which is everything takes longer and it costs more. So uh, when you first try to source a product from China, you're like, I know what I want. I found this thing on Alibaba, and you're, you're imagining that you know if it's 30-day lead time, I can have this thing here in 30 to 31 days from the, the moment you decide you want it. But it always takes longer, and inevitably it costs more, right? You'll forget about some tariff or some duty or something that you never contemplated going in because you didn't kind of – uh, have the time to engineer the, the outcome. So the the reason I mention this is because if you always kind of know in the back of your mind that th to expect surprises, when things take longer, that's an unwelcome surprise. When things cost more, that's a bad surprise, right? Uh, we prefer good surprises, right? Hey, this is faster and cheaper than you thought, but it, it's not likely to happen. <laughs> it's certainly, anytime you develop a product, it, it just always seems to take longer and cost more. When you're onboarding a brand new factory, the first run, for example, of a product, it just takes longer and it costs more. That's okay. It's just part of the process. If you understand that going in, you're going to be better prepared. And then over time, you get better incrementally. Things get better and better. And the more you do business with that factory and the more things become systemic, the easier, be, the easier it is where – I, I was talking with uh, parts of my team uh, in the last couple of days, and you know, in the last week, they probably cleared 25 or 30 containers uh, on their way to clearing about 140 containers this month, and it's just part of the process. Uh, nobody's breaking a sweat. You know, it's not like they're uh, you know working hard. That's just that's what we do. We work, but it's nothing's breaking, right? There, there's no chaos, and really fundamentally. Uh, a good buddy of mine, Mike Boshart, I'll probably have him on in the future. He says, you know, part of his mission in product development or merchandising is to bring order from chaos, right? Bring order from chaos. And if you follow, you know, and understand these seven steps that we're talking about here, you will bring order from chaos because you'll be prepared. And again, point number six is all about preparing mentally for this kind of inevitable surprises you're going to have. And I'll give you a, a quick uh, horror story from a, a buddy of mine. He's a brand new seller. He sees the opportunity to sell online. He's really excited by it. And that's great. Uh, he he's vets out a, a few factories, picks one, not the cheapest one, but one that looks uh, pretty good to him. And he's really excited about it. And then he gets the product that ships all the way to America. And it turns out he can't get that product into America because it's got like a two or 300 percent import duty on it and it's because it's a certain size that the duty applies to if it was a slightly smaller and i'm talking about like an inch or two smaller uh it's possible that it would have gotten through without the the 200 duty but because it it happened to incur this duty now he can't even bring it into the u.s and and make any money right you can't double or triple your cost and still make money well, again, there's there's different margin structures. But in this case, let's just assume that's correct, and I, I, it absolutely is correct. So he decides, well, then I'm going to ship it to another country, in this case, Canada. So he ships it to Canada, kind of sorts through and gets through all that mess, and he learned a ton. And if I ask him, 
does everything takes long take longer and cost more? He would give an unequivocal absolutely it does. Uh, and so I, I just don't want you guys to think that this is somehow unique to you or that maybe you're so special that it's not going to apply to you. Even if you had the first order, the second order, the third order go perfect with no delays and no surprise costs, it's coming. It's coming, right? And again, I will re-recommend that book. Go read the book Poorly Made in China. And you can see Paul Midler's new book called What's, uh, What's Wrong with China? And that's the great Paul Midler. I hope to have him on an Awesomers podcast in the very near future to talk about his books. And But in, in Poorly Made in China, I think, is a fundamental piece that anybody who's importing product or buying in China needs to read because it tells you the way it is. And it really gives you a sense of what's happening over there. So I know I'm ranting, so I'm going to move on. All right, so the number seven is lack of compliance. So these are things like, do they have MSDS sheets for your product? Do they have the appropriate FDA certifications if that's required? Are they an FDA-approved factory on, you know, in addition to whatever uh, documents they require? Do you have any required testing, um, for example, batteries or chemical composition? Do you have uh, licenses for things like Bluetooth? Uh, if it's a patented product, are you maintaining compliance with patents? Are you aware of the duties, uh, countervailing duties, anti-dumping duties, uh, and some of these tariffs that are being bantied about right now? Uh, do you, uh, by the way, your lack of awareness of these things doesn't mean that you get out of them. So I've heard a lot of people when I when I share some of these things, they're like, ah, oh, I've been imported from China for three whole years and I haven't had a single problem. And and you know what? Um, when I first looked it up, my product it would have had a twenty percent uh, duty, but the the factory gave me a different code code that has a zero percent duty. Now that always makes my skin crawl because. When when your freight forwarder says this is this is the duty your product falls under, you should take you should pay close attention to that, especially if your factory comes back and goes no no just use this just use this HTC code because uh, now you don't have to uh, pay a duty right and and you're like well obviously I don't want to pay an extra twenty percent I'll just do that, but the reality is it's up to customs to decide which code is most applicable to you. And by the way, you can even send in your product and have them classify it for you so that you have it in writing from them. And then if they choose the 0% later, if they change their mind, it's not your problem. But I want to be sure everybody knows this. Customs can retroactively enforce collection of duties, countervailing duties, any of the things. Uh, and I don't believe there's a limit. I know guys, you know, they're talking about six, seven, eight, nine years that they're potentially on the hook for enforcement. And the way the enforcement works is like this. Uh, you imported for three or four years, and you put down this particular HTC code. And then customs, for whatever reason, decided to screen or uh, do an intensive examination on one of your products. And then they determined, you know what? The HTC code you put on here is wrong, uh, and it actually is supposed to have this 20% duty. Then what they say is anything you've imported that has this HTC in the past, we're going to retroactively, and this is a potential, it's not a sure thing, but they have the potential to retroactively enforce on, on those prior FT, uh, HTC codes, especially if they came from the same factory, right? Because Customs looks and go, well, you bought this product from this factory and you use this HTC code and we just did an intensive examination. They determined that it was wrong and you owe us 20%. We're going to do that retroactively to you. So for all the guys who say, oh, my factory's got a little secret or my, you know, I can squeeze this by, just trust me. You know, Customs is going to get paid. Do the right thing. Make sure that compliance is absolutely 100% done. Don't, do not try to uh, be slick about it. And China has lots of slick ways, and they're now kind of being beaten back. But some of the slick ways is if you have an $8,000 order, some of the factories go, ah, we'll just ship it in, you know, four orders for $1,997 so that we can ship them by air and come under the, the duty and customs thresholds. Well, now customs is enforcing lower limits, uh, as low as $650. And in some cases, at some particular ports of call, particularly around Amazon areas, they're doing full enforcement. So my point is, no matter what a Chinese resource tells you about how they can kind of be sneaky and get around these things, it's not worth the risk. 
it's just not worth the risk. Every, you know, all the guys who are, are properly doing business are on the same equal footing. If there's a 20% duty, just pay the duty and move on with your life. Uh, it's definitely not worth trying to, to uh, trick the government. It just doesn't work. Uh, again, I'm not saying this to freak you out. I'm just sharing experience. And I have a friend of mine. He only imported a product for about a year and a half. They misidentified it. They mischaracterized it. And in my opinion, the factory that was helping them did it on purpose because it was instead of 8%, it was 0% uh, duty. And so they took the 0% and they were fat and happy and, and they went on for whatever, a year and a half. And then they had a, a container pulled in for examination and they got retroactively applied that 8% for that year and a half, which came up to $170,000. And that was without the criminal penalties that could be attached to it if they think you're doing it on purpose. So again, please pay full attention to this. Just because something worked in the past or because something squeezed through doesn't mean you're in the clear. And be extra careful of the requirements of the importer of record, the IOR. If you're the importer of record, you are legally responsible for what comes in. If your factory is giving you a DDP price, that means delivered and duty paid, then maybe they're the importer of record and they can do what they want and it, your price is kind of baked into you know whatever they tell you your DDP price is. But if you're paying an FOB price, which means freight on board, uh, that's you know when it, when it gets freight on board to the container company, let's say at a port of call like Shanghai, an FOB price means everything after that FOB point is your responsibility. So I, I, I'm not going to get too much into the import-export details today, but lack of compliance is definitely my number seven. And it's not a lucky number seven. It's a scary number seven. All right, so in summary, let's just kind of go through this really quick. If you don't consider the results that you're looking for in the beginning, this is number one, and you don't consider the needs of all parties, you're going to make a mistake. You have the potential to have an experience that's less than perfect. Number two, ineffective communication. Beware of the word yes. It doesn't always mean yes. could mean hell no. Uh, the, having no purchasing system that is sufficient to track not just the financial performance but uh, variations and uh, to you know, uh, manage your, your product, that's a problem. Number four, lack of specifications. Either poorly defined specifications or no specifications at all, totally unacceptable. Number five, inadequate supply chain inspection and enforcement. If you're going to buy something, you better inspect it. If it's uh, enough volume, you better attach lab tests and other requirements and then measure against those requirements. Now, the factory should do those kind of on an ongoing basis to make sure they run the test to, to ensure quality. But you should do third-party independent audits of that from time to time. And by the way, you should pay for it if those pass. And if they don't, they should pay for it and the container may be rejected. In many of our terms, if they miss a specification, we can reject the entire container, even after it's shipped, by the way, and not pay them for it. Uh, and then number six is underestimating the time and the resources required, especially money. Uh, remember, it always takes longer and costs more. And number seven is compliance management is either lacking or entirely forgotten. And I don't want you to forget about compliance, particularly with the law and customs and things like that. These are really, really important. And they're, they're hard lessons learned along the way for many of us, myself included. We've had many horror stories that I haven't had time to go into. But I really do hope that this gives you kind of some guiding principles on how you can manage your supply chain. Now, this has been uh, episode number nine of the awesomers.com uh, uh, podcast. And... I hope that you found this insightful as the uh, title of this episode format you know, really is meant to inspire insights to be delivered from me to you. And I really hope that they have been. And I, I highly encourage you to, to share with us. You can go on to awesomers.com and find the contact form or you can find us on some of the social stuff online and just let us know how we're doing. If you hate it, tell us because uh, you know we can do something different or, or make it better and, and not burn the calories on stuff you hate. And if you like it or it's there, there's things we can tweak about it, don't hesitate to give us some feedback. You know, fundamentally, you know, I'm at your service. I want this to be something that is meaningful and beneficial to you, not something that you, uh, you know, decide not to waste time on in the future. This only works 
if this is engaging and, and something you're into long term. So again, to find show notes, go to awesomers.com backslash nine, and you'll be able to find all the show details and notes, including some of the book recommendations I made for you. 